All right. Well, hi, everybody. Um, thanks for coming to our, our session on um, kind of an overview of the criminalization of hepatitis C. Uh, my name is Andrew Reynolds. I'm the hepatitis C wellness manager at the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. Uh, that's kind of my day job. And then the work on hep C criminalization is actually um, things that I did even before coming to the AIDS Foundation. And I've continued on as kind of like a consultant. And my, uh, my colleague, Jada Hicks, is here without a camera, but we can still hear her. Jada? Hi, everyone. I apologize about not having the camera on, but Verizon internet is the worst. Um, but I'm Jada Hicks. I'm with the Center for HIV Law and Policy. I'm the supervising attorney of our criminal justice initiatives, and I head up our um, positive justice project work, which works on HIV anti-criminalization and also hepatitis anti-criminalization. Um, I think we wanted to start today being a little bit more conversational and just kind of figure out um, what everyone's knowledge base is surrounding HEP criminalization. Obviously, a lot of people are familiar with HIV criminalization. So I just wanted to open the floor and see what do people know about hepatitis criminalization? Do you know about it? And if you've never heard of it, I'd love to, to hear you share that as well. I, I guess I'll join in and say that um, I only know um, to the extent when laws say communicable disease that it includes hep C. Um, beyond that, I don't know any hep C specific laws. I just typically understood them to be um, always lumped in together when we talk about communicable diseases in, in statutes. I think we also have some comments in the chat too yeah. um, about uh, Mary said um, she didn't know that hep C was criminalized as well. Yep, that's very, very common. Looks like we've got somebody from um, Missouri and Missouri is a state that um, criminalizes hepatitis C, viral hepatitis. Um, But yeah, I actually think that's very common. I mean, it's a sort of low key issue um, that, you know, it's certainly not as common as HIV criminalization. That's common in a lot more states. You all know that. Um, viral hepatitis is um, criminalized now in 12 states. When we actually first started this, it was 13 states. It's down to 12. And Jada will talk more about, about um about that. And then the only other thing we wanted to check in with folks was like, one of the things that's really kind of infuriating about the criminalization of hepatitis C is that it's, you know, things that are very low to no risk of hep C transmission kind of become criminalized. And so because, you know, hep C, um, uh, just to kind of give a, a quick overview, hep C is primarily transmitted from blood to blood contact. Um, the most common way today would be the sharing of syringes um, or other injection equipment. Um, we screen it in the blood supply, so it's not going to be, you know, uh, transmitted that way. Um, sexual transmission is extremely low risk. Um, there is a greater risk of sexual transmission of hep C in people living with HIV uh, for reasons that aren't fully understood, but people living with HIV who report no risk from like um, uh, substance use, um, there are higher rates of, of, of hepatitis C in that population and the primary risk factor is through sex. But for individuals who are HIV uninfected, um, the risk of sexual transmission is quite low. You can't get it from casual contact, hugs, kisses, sharing of glasses, food, that type of thing. You can't get it from spitting. Um, and that actually has been something that has been brought against people. They've been accused of spitting on people. They're hep C positive. They're, they, they, they're, 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 um, get criminalized for that. Um, so, you know, when we talk about how hep C is transmitted, it doesn't jive with the way certain individuals are targeted 
and um, and busted. So that's kind of a quick overview of Hep C transmission. Yeah, and I'm gonna um, actually share my screen as well. Um, I think last time, Andrew, we we presented on um, Hep C. The common refrain was that people had not heard um, that hepatitis was criminalized. And so it is kind of a new topic for individuals, even if they've been doing this advocacy work for a really long time. And so one thing that I wanted to highlight, let me share my screen real quick. Um, because I know Stephen, you mentioned this as well, like uh, how these laws came to be and thinking like, oh, it's just always in a communicable disease statute. So I'm gonna run through that really quickly and then you know we'll we'll regroup. Andrew has um, some slides as, as well. And so um, so how did we get to a point where we're even criminalizing viral hepatitis? Um, so we saw it as a reform strategy. You see it in some states um, as basically instead of having what they call HIV exceptionalism, where it's just HIV that they single out they will broaden the definition of communicable disease and it includes viral hepatitis, which as many of you know, it opens up the door to who can face pro prosecution. Um, we also saw a number of states that just started proposing new criminal laws to target viral hepatitis. Um, so, and also a major increase in burden of virus, uh, viral hepatitis due to the opioid crisis, which of course we know is on, ongoing. Um, and so I want to tie this into HIV criminalization as well, just so that you can get the foundational basis for this. So HIV criminalization, um, the creation of new charges, or excuse me, creation of laws and increased penalties targeting people diagnosed with HIV for conduct that is either legal or less severely punished for individuals who have not been diagnosed with HIV. So it's basically based on your disease status. Um, I'm not going to go too much into this because I feel like everyone kind of has the HIV 101. Um, it just over 30 states criminalize it, and it, it goes through a, a number of ways that HIV is criminalized as well. So with hepatitis, uh, Andrew kind of touched on this about how um, HIV is criminalized in terms of what behaviors are targeted. Um, I wanted to also talk on what is criminalized. So they may criminalize viral hepatitis generally, or they can actually specifically name a certain type of hepatitis as well. So hep B or hep C, can be specifically called out in the statute. Um, spitting, biting, bodily fluid exposure, sex without prior disclosure, needle sharing, and quote unquote, knowing exposure are all criminalized. So it's all the same things we see with uh, HIV criminalization. And uh, it is a serious felony. So in certain states, it adds on quite a bit of time to your sentence, or um, it can be an enhancement as well. This is our redone map. As Andrew said, there were 13 states that criminalized uh, viral hepatitis. That number is now down to 12. So this kind of just goes through what um, states criminalize hepatitis, how they criminalize it, if it's a certain type of criminalized um, hepatitis like hep B or hep C, or if it's just viral hepatitis and also what behaviors are criminalized as well. Uh, we kind of updated this to a new category if you'll see toward the right hand of the screen here with the yellow box, states where laws are written, written broadly enough um, that someone living with viral hepatitis could be prosecuted. So the, we definitely see that as well. Um, so we've got a lot of things that combine to create this perfect public health storm surrounding hepatitis. Um, you know, treatment access is often restricted there's the prohibition against drug paraphernalia and syringe access. Um, we also have a tie-in with the correctional crisis and not being able to access treatment and prevention as well. What's the problem with these laws? They're unfair. Again, the same thing you see with, with HIV criminalization. Um, there's no intent to prove harm or intent to transmit disease. Disease transmission doesn't occur. Um, you heard Andrew talking about how spitting cannot transmit, yet that is often criminalized, especially when it um, is in relation to correctional officers or police officers. They're unscientific, so we're criminalizing behaviors that pose no negligible and low risk. It furthers the stigma that surrounds viral hepatitis and that people living with viral hepatitis are vectors for disease. It most certainly conflicts with public health um, aims of universal vaccination, treatment, and access and cure. 
Um, and it obviously disproportionately affects marginalized communities. We've known that for quite some time. So people that are current or formerly incarcerated, people of color, um, people living with HIV and people who inject drugs. Um, I broke it down a little bit more into how these law, laws came to be, excuse my typo of the 13 states instead of 12. Um, so that should be 12. So simultaneously criminalizing hepatitis and long HIV within the same piece of legislation. Um, so this is what Stephen touched on a little bit when he was saying this is what he knew about uh, viral hepatitis. So you're criminalizing viral hepatitis along with some other communicable disease. Um, also, the, another way is to add hepatitis into an already existing HIV criminalization statute. Iowa that I touched on earlier, this was one of their reform strategies, was to expand the scope of criminalized conditions and viral hepatitis was then included in that definition. So I'm not going to read this, but this is just a specific example of how they enumerate a certain type of hepatitis to criminalize. Um, this is another example of a person with hep C from South Dakota and what activities they would be criminalized for. Um, I'm now going to pass it over to Andrew to talk about the criminalization of drug use and um, syringe use and how that ties in with hep C. Andrew, if you'll just say next whenever you need me to hit next. Will do. Um, yeah, so, you know, kind of continuing on that, that idea of the perfect public health storm. You know, there are so many ways in which the criminalization of viral hepatitis is unjust. Um, not the least of which is the fact that in many of these states, you don't have access to the tools that would prevent transmission to somebody else. And you potentially don't have access to getting cured. And we know U equals U for HIV, U definitely equals U for hepatitis C, because when you're treated and cured, there's no more virus um, in your body to transmit. Um, so, you know, this intersection of we're gonna criminalize substance use, we're gonna criminalize access to um, um, sterile syringes and injection equipment, we're gonna prevent you from getting into hep C treatment, all sort of kind of comes together on the bodies of people uh, living with or at risk for viral hepatitis. Um, so as we know, all states um, and the federal government criminalize drug possession and law enforcement across the country make more arrests for drug charges than any other type of crime in the United States. Um, Oregon has kind of got a little bit of a decrim model going that I hope is going to start to trickle um, uh, across the United States. Um, and then there's a number of states that continue to criminalize the possession of paraphernalia, para drug paraphernalia uh, which includes unused syringes, cotton, cookers, all the things that people need to remain hep C negative. Um, now we're getting a little bit better. There is a lot of really great work happening um, at, at local, state, and federal levels to bring harm reduction tools um, to people who use drugs in the communities where, where they live. Um, so we're starting to see, you know, greater access to um, um, funding for harm reduction interventions, um, decriminalization of, 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 of syringe services. Um, and, you know, even the previous president, uh, well, not the president, the president's people recognized that this was an important issue. And there was um, um, a lot of funding that went into um, some harm reduction interventions, um, mainly in response to, to the opioid crisis. Next slide. And so here's where yeah, we're kind of thinking through the intersections. Um, and you know, it, this applies to people living with HIV as well as people with viral hepatitis. And if you use substances, in, um, inject or smoke for that matter, uh, you face criminalization in sort of three distinct ways. You've got the criminal laws that target um, people who could potent, you know, share injection equipment, um, you've got the laws, so that's the sort of criminalizing of the transmission. Then you've got the laws that criminalize the possession, purchase, or distribution of substances and or drug paraphernalia. And then all the laws that criminalize drug use and possession. 
So there's multiple ways in which a person who is using substances and either living with or at risk for viral hepatitis is sort of under you know, a, a significant amount of, of stress and fear of arrest. And you know, we know that punishment is not effective public health. It's gonna drive people further away from accessing testing, care, and treatment. All the things that we need to do to eliminate viral hepatitis transmission. Next slide. Um, and so, you know, there are a number of states that have specifically named uh, the sharing of injection equipment. Um, and then it's also worth noting that, you know, a lot of times folks don't have a choice. Um, they get arrested for a certain drug offense, they have to test. So an individual might not even know their status at the time. Um, and then they're arrested, they test, they're positive. Oh, guess what? We're going to enhance your sentence as a, as a consequence. We see this in, in sex workers as well. Um, as Jada mentioned, the criminalization of viral hepatitis um, and harm reduction writ large kind of hits some, you know, the, our, our, our already marginalized and underserved communities. Um, people of color, LGBTQ people, um, unhoused folks, and so on. Uh, youth, especially are, are, are targeted in, under um, uh, uh, drug laws. And youth are actually a, you know, a, a, a fast growing population, particularly within viral hepatitis. Rather than criminalize and punish, let's open up and test and treat. These are the interventions that we need to do. Um, it enhances fear and promotes stigma. I'm gonna be less likely to disclose my status to somebody if I'm afraid that that can be used against me. We know that happens in, in HIV um, and that certainly can happen in viral hepatitis. Let's remove that criminal element and we're gonna improve communication and openness and access to care and treatment. And then as we've said, there's just, just you know, terrible public health consequences. Um, I'm working on a little chart that I was almost gonna share, but it's a mess, so I'm not gonna share. But you know, it goes back to that idea of of the perfect public health storm, where when we criminalize the transmission of viral hepatitis, we discourage people to test. We discourage them for accessing care. Um, if we have restrictions on their access to treatment, then I might know I've got hepatitis C and I would love to get cured so I don't transmit it to anybody else, but your state Medicaid laws um, are preventing me from, from, from accessing uh, treatment until I meet certain benchmarks. I'll talk about that in a, in a second. We don't provide people with the tools to prevent transmission, sterile syringes, injection equipment, safe consumption spaces. Um, we've, we've gotten better at uh, providing people with access to, to medication assisted treatment like buprenorphine or methadone. That's great for opioids, but for individuals who use stimulants, we really don't have um, um, any, any MAT for that population. So, you know, if we provide the people with the tools to A, get cured or B, prevent transmission, we don't need to criminalize. Um, Jada mentioned the intersection within uh, the criminal justice system. People with viral hepatitis come into contact with law enforcement at extremely high rates. Um, uh, the last time I checked, it was like one in three people living with hepatitis passes through um, uh, jail or prison um, each year. It might be jail for a couple of days. It might be prison for really enhanced sentences, but you know, uh, we target people who use drugs and therefore we arrest them and they you know, end up in jail or prison. Um, and then we do a lousy job of educating people around hepatitis C transmission of, you know, um, of, 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 of creating safe spaces in medical settings for people to come in and, and access care and treatment. And so all of these come together to just, you know, enhance hep C transmission. It certainly doesn't prevent the transmission of viral hepatitis. Next slide. Um, Sort of talked about this uh, quite a bit and Jay to jump in, but you know, um, it just stigmatizes and discriminates. Um, we know that none of this is evidence-based. Again, if I have hepatitis C and I accidentally, if I spit on somebody, that's gross. 
but I'm not going to transmit the virus to anybody. Um, the odds of transmission, even if it's somebody like spit directly into my eye, are just in, infinitesimally small. Um, I think the big one is also undermining bodily and economic autonomy. Um, I, I really like that this line. Um, you know, it 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 it, it infringes on my ability to take care of myself, but then you won't let me take care of myself because perhaps my state Medicaid, um, like in Mississippi, for example, if I have hepatitis C and I want to get treated, I have to be quote sober from substances for six months. Now we know that people who use drugs can be treated and cured of hepatitis C at essentially the same rates as people who don't use substances. Um, but this unreasonable bar uh, barrier to access care prevents me from, from taking my hep C treatment. Andrew, Next I slide. also wanted to hop in with a um, real life example of stigma that I saw the other day and see if anyone has ever seen anything like this before. But I um, obviously was on social media and I saw someone post a meme on Facebook about basically the um, tagline was like, why is it that I have to pay hundreds of dollars for an EpiPen, but an addict can come in and get Narcan for free um, to keep them from ODing. And I thought that's exactly the stigma that surrounds, you know, people that may have hepatitis, um, AIDS, certainly obviously people who inject drugs. Um, I thought it was just like the perfect example of the stigma that surrounds all of these intersectional issues. I don't know if anyone has ever seen what I'm the meme that I'm talking about or seen anything like that. Um, it was I, I thought it was just like so disheartening to actually like see it on social media. I feel like that's just a real world example of the stigma that surrounds yeah. all of all of these issues, honestly. I was stuck on mute. Sorry. No, I've actually seen that same meme, Jada. And I actually had a friend. It was something like, like, like you just said, like, why do I have to pay $1,500 for an EpiPen when, a, you know, their words, junkie can get Narcan for free. And my friend crossed out, why do I have to pay $1,500 for an EpiPen? Like, that's a, that's, that's a problem. Let's talk about universal health care. You know, that's a much better um, uh, approach to, to public health. Let's not pit one against the other. Right. Um, so we are also, although it has been a long time in the making, coming out with a viral hepatitis toolkit. It's going to have three primers, um, talks about the roots and risk of transmission, criminalization, and HCV and incarcerated population. It's also going to have syringe service program fact sheets, state laws, and state access fact sheets. Um, so it's basically a snapshot. Oh my goodness, I cannot talk. I'm sorry. Snapshot of what criminalization of viral hepatitis is. Um, it kind of is pointing out all these intersectional cross sections and it explains the correctional setting and access to care and treatment. And it gives advocates the tools to effectively address intersectional issues with legislators. So the goal is basically that you would be able to take out the section of the toolkit on your state and you would be able to knowledgeably talk to a legislator about um, this issue yourself. And so that is really the goal um, of the toolkit. And then I've also put up everyone that was involved, their, their titles and, and email addresses. I'm gonna actually um, stop sharing my screen now if I can figure out how, <laughs> bear with me. Yeah, this is a lousy way to show it, but here's, here's a draft. Um, and like Jada said, there's um, different sections. So like, you know, one of the things that I mentioned was dependent upon the state, um, even if you wanted treatment, you might not have access to it. So of the um, 12 states that uh, criminalize viral hepatitis, they also have um, sobriety restrictions or fibrosis restrictions. So over time, hepatitis C scars the liver. Um, and they might say, oh, you're not, you don't have enough scarring yet. To be eligible for treatment you know they you have to wait to get sicker before you can get cured those are going away state by state by state 
So it's much better now than it was, say, three years ago, certainly than it was when the drugs first came out. That was more of a cost-cutting intervention. State Medicaid didn't want to pay for the hep C drugs, so they created these, these barriers. Um, um, so each, um, each state has what we call a treatment access report card, and we have that in the toolkit. We uh, break down the um, syringe and paraphernalia laws in each state. And then we have the, um, the viral hepatitis statutes for each state. So it sort of becomes a one-stop shop. Like if you wanted to meet with your legislators to, um, to change that law, everything you would need would be in that toolkit. You could actually you know, photocopy everything for your state as like a handout when you, when you do like a ledge packet, that type of a thing. Um, so we hope it becomes a really valuable tool to, to help folks in these respective states um, get rid of these laws. And I do see one question um, in the chat that I wanted to address. And, and then Andrew, if you're um, okay, I'd love to open up the floor for any other questions. Um, someone was asking, um, are people with hep C targeted under general endangerment, endangerment excuse me, laws? And the answer is they could be. Um, you don't necessarily, when we see this with HIV, if there isn't um, a specific law in reference to that disease, it doesn't mean someone can't be prosecuted. They can still use general criminal laws if the elements of the offense are met by whatever activity the person engaged in. Um, I don't think we see this as often with hepatitis as we do with HIV, but that doesn't mean that it can't happen. I hope that, I hope that made sense. Um, and then if anyone else has any other questions, uh, Andrew and I just want to open the floor, answer any questions for you. I have a question. Um, have there, like, so most of the states that have the hep C laws, do they usually also have, sorry, my chat is going crazy, like HIV criminalization laws as well? And there have there been any efforts to like tie the two together in terms of, you know, modernizing them or repealing them or anything like that? Yeah, so um, there have been some efforts to tie it in. So they do have standalone statutes about um, hepatitis. So for instance, Ohio has that, but they criminalize HIV as well. Sometimes it gets a little tricky, um, right, in advocacy efforts because <laughs> As a negotiating point, um, people will say like, you still criminalize hepatitis, so it's okay that we're kind of reforming the stuff on, on HIV. Um, I feel like, and Andrew, you you might agree or, or disagree, so just correct me if, if so. Like, I feel like hepatitis is often forgot, um, forgotten about. And so I feel like the focus is so much on HIV that hepatitis kind of gets put on the back burner um, and part of that is because it is more easily transmittable compared to HIV, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we have vaccine prevention, we have cures, we have treatment. Um, and so I feel like a lot of times people just don't consider reforming laws that have anything to do with hepatitis. Um, or they are more focused on another area and don't want to use like their political capacity to include hepatitis. Yeah, I agree. Hepatitis kind of flies under the radar in a lot of different ways. And um, uh, criminalization reform is one of them. I mean, actually, the way this started was the Michigan example. Like, I just randomly saw a news report about a Michigan law that was going to um, add criminalization of, of viral hepatitis. And the lawmaker, like, you know, his quote was just obscene like just infuriated me. And I, I sent an email to a, a hepatitis listserv. I was like, hey, anybody know about this? Do we got people in Michigan? And uh, a few folks did get together and fortunately prevented that law from, from becoming enacted. But from that, that's how this little coalition was built. And um, uh, you know, we're, we're hoping that it will be a project where we partner with organizations in the respective states to kind of raise the issue. Um, there was a concern, 
and this was kind of an interesting one. Um, well, maybe we don't want to raise it because if we raise it, people will be like, oh, that's a good idea. Let's actually do it. Because I do think I'm a little cynical about this, but like Jada was mentioning, like, I think one of the ways that people will try to like keep HIV criminalization on the books is to open it up to other conditions to make it look less sort of finger pointing and stigmatizing. Yep. Um, and so, you know, there was, there was that tension for a while, but uh, ultimately we were like, yeah, but this is actually happening. People are being unfairly um, targeted and it could potentially get worse. So we need to get ahead, ahead of it. We can't wait for it. And, and we do see that in certain states where to satisfy HIV advocates, they have said, well, the law isn't HIV specific anymore. So it's not stigmatizing. We're not singling out people living with HIV. And it's like, okay, but now you've just thrown an entire other group of people under the bus that can now face prosecution. And if people don't have questions for us, we have a very broad question for you, but let's wait. Anybody else have any questions? I, I have a question and this is actually kind of a broad one. So we've worked on um, HIV decriminalization in Colorado and the tendency was kind of just what Jada mentioned, which is to say, well, HIV is not as bad or not as expensive or to, to throw another group under the bus. And so, and in the broadest sense, um, can you talk about what HIV advocates can work on to include this? Is it to just be inclusive in the messaging? Um, what does that look like? So I think it's a little bit layered, right? Part of it is making sure that people living with hepatitis um, or that have had, had been living with hepatitis are at the table as well, right? The other part is it's, it's kind of a red herring. Like it's not, is it really less stigmatizing if we throw in other diseases? Uh, I would say the answer is no. I don't think that's a good compromise. Um, and lastly, I think what we need to be really like paying attention to is the definition for um, communicable disease. There is a way to define communicable disease. So, so that we're saying it's causes serious lifelong complications. Um, we're talking about how it's non-airborne, that it requires treatment. And that way we can kind of, even though the definition isn't specific to HIV, it, it does narrow it down um, to which communicable diseases can be included for prosecution. Um, so I think, I think a lot of what is missing um, in all honesty is like, I don't, I'm trying to think of my coalitions. Like, I don't know of anyone in the state coalitions where I'm actively involved in, where there's someone living with hepatitis that participates. Um, and I know not, obviously not every state criminalizes hepatitis, but we're, we're in states that do, and I, we still don't have any advocates at the table. Thank you. And I think that's a really good reminder, um, you know, for our current HIV, we've now expanded to our statewide um, board is viral hepatitis, HIV, and STIs. Talk about throwing the net wide. Yep. And everyone who is at that table, because it originally started out as an HIV specific table, um, has HIV expertise and, and perhaps um, connected with hepatitis C groups, but not the expertise. So that's a great reminder, I think, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, and I would add one of the reasons why Jade and I were so excited to present here was to you know build these relationships and then learn from the successes in the HIV community um, so that we can potentially replicate um, and, and, and do this work. Um, there's a lot of coalition building to do. That's one of the roles that one of our partners um, is, is working with you know, various harm reduction advocates in you know, these respective states so that we can, like Jada said, we can have um, representation of, of, of the communities that are directly impacted by these laws.
Hey everybody, I joined a little bit late, um, but I'm a Jada fan and very interested in this topic. I heard a story one time um, on serving, I was serving on like one of these advisory boards, um, the federal advisory board, and they brought in an expert who said that their coalition chose to partner with police to argue that um, well, decriminalizing um, syringes and Hep C, um, allowing for um, clean syringes, um, was an occupational benefit to the police force. I just thought that was a really interesting approach. Yeah. You know, I mean, however we can get to where we get. Yeah, this is actually like not not in the United States, but in Europe, where they actually have in, in certain countries. Um, uh, syringe service programs in their jails and prisons. One of the ways that they were able to convince people to do it was it would protect jail and prison staff. Um, and so a lot of folks were like, oh, damn, if we can use that to improve access to sterile syringes for our people there who use drugs, let's do it, you know? And so, yeah, I think, you know, when we talk about like, I mean, condoms in, in, um, um, in prisons was another one where we could be like, oh, you know what, if we could prevent transmission amongst individuals inside, we're going to prevent transmission to people when they get out, you know, that type of a thing. Um, I would prefer that we would want to decriminalize, you know, syringes and, 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 and drug possession and, and those types of things for the sake of the individuals who need it. But I'm with you. If we could figure out a way to bring in unlikely allies by demonstrating how this this will creep out and protect everybody i'm all for it that's one of our arguments when we argue for safe consumption spaces you know we talk about how oh, if you bring somebody inside to use substances you reduce public injecting you reduce public discarding of of um syringes and other paraphernalia when my number one reason for safe consumption spaces is because nobody dies you know um so yeah, whatever we can do to get the message out there. I like that, Devin. And we'll have Jada t-shirts made. You can keep funny. I'm a huge Devin <laughs> fan too, by the way. Like <laughs> and Andrew, I'm like, I Andrew, I was describing you to someone. I was like, he's always the one that dresses really well. <laughs> do you know him? <laughs> oh, you're now my new favorite. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, kind of related to what Barb was asking us, I, I, we wanted to kind of ask folks, because you are doing this in the HIV realm, and for the hepatitis community, are there sort of like recommendations, best practices, things that we can learn from you to bring into our decrim work? That's my phone going crazy in the background. Um. I'll, I'll just speak up. I made a point yesterday that um, the focus, so much of the focus is oftentimes on um, making the laws reflect the science and include the science. But what we're really seeing is that the science is not um, serving everyone right now um, within public health. So there are communities, particularly black gay men and HIV um, that are not well served when we only talk about the science. So um, doing as much as we can to, um, you know, narrow that specific intent to cause harm. I don't know how applicable that is to Hep C. I don't know what the accusations look like when we're talking about Hep C, but um, yeah, I just feel like we need to be very purposeful about like protecting folks. Oh, that's excellent. I like that. Yeah, you know, Devin, I think about being careful as well. Um, you know, in Colorado, when we were working on our laws in 2016, it was right when um, sort of the undetectable is not able to transmit HIV was coming out. And it was really easy to 
lean into that as being the answer, that if people are undetectable, that they shouldn't be criminalized, which left, you know, we know in the United States that 50% of people living with HIV based on the last um, cascade that I had seen are not able to maintain um, viral suppression. So that leaves all of them at risk. And so it's, it's kind of the, um, I guess the go for the complicated, go for the complicated solution and talk about the, the justice of the laws as opposed to just relying on the, the science as the easy answer. Yeah, and it would just be so much easier to give our people eight weeks of treatment, 12 weeks of treatment, they're cured of hep C, there's no more transmission. It's a hell of a lot cheaper too. You know, I wonder if that like kind of like an economic message. Now that never really works in the drug war. Yeah, accusations continue. Um, and then the other one that we think about a lot is continuing to kind of intersect with the harm reduction community. Um, you know, with the opioid crisis continuing to rage, you're starting to see sort of like, you know, the, 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 the opposite of a good Samaritan law, where like, if you call 911 at the scene of a drug overdose, you're potentially at risk for arrest or people getting busted for, you know, um, dealing fentanyl when maybe they don't even know that what they're, what they have is fentanyl. Um, so making sure that we can continue to work to sort of stop um, other ways in which um, uh, this country likes to criminalize um, behaviors. Like if you want to prevent overdose, don't criminalize, you know, um, the, the calling of 911, the, the presence of Narcan, that type of a thing. Can you give a hypothetical? What is, what, what is the scenario when this is criminalized? What are some of the things that are at play? Um, you mean like from the, the overdose or the hep C? Hep C. You know, I, there was a really good hypothetical um, that um, the O'Neill Institute at Georgetown kind of put out when they first reported um, on our, our fact sheet that we, we put out a couple of years ago um, to just sort of demonstrate how inane a law like this would be. If I remember correctly, it was something like, all right, you got two people who are at a grocery store and they're in line at the pharmacy at the grocery store getting their meds. And then later um, in the produce section, they get into a big argument. And in the course of that argument, one person is spitting on the other. And um, the person who got spat upon um, remembered that the other person who was in line with them at the pharmacy was picking up hep C treatments that they saw on a television commercial. And so that person who was spat upon could then say, this person with hepatitis C spit on me and get that sort of sentence enhanced accordingly. And that's a, a hypothetical, but we've actually seen that in the real world where um, an individual who was accused of spitting on police um, was then tested for hep C. And when they found out the person had hep C, the enhanced sentence uh, uh, went up. Um, we've definitely seen it in prisons as well. I have like anecdotal evidence of that. There's no way you're going to get hep C from spitting. And exposure doesn't automatically mean infection. So even if a person had hep C, 
and they spat on somebody. I don't know if testing was required or if the person, like it was known that the person had hep C. Um, um, but again, even if those, even if there was a risk of transmission, those two police didn't have to test positive in order for the person to be further prosecuted. But that's just an example that I can think of. I don't know if Jada, if you have others. I mean, I think um, Devin, one that that would be familiar to you would be obviously the correctional setting one and um, the enhancement for hepatitis when the person is living with hepatitis. Um, I think that one gets probably used the the most that uh, that I know about. Um, besides sharing of drug, drug equipment, I guess, but the, the spitting is a pretty popular way for corrections officers and police to charge people living with hepatitis. Nope, I see a very important bio break announcement in the chat. Um, closing plenary in about 10 minutes now. Um, I think it actually starts at 4.30. I'm not positive. Okay. Was on the yeah, I, think, I think we end at, yeah. well, I'm on the West Coast, so it's 1.05 my time. <laughs> yeah, we, we end at 15, we have 10 more minutes, and then there's a 15 minute break before the plenary session, so. I also don't think it'll break anybody's heart if we've run our course and end a little bit early. <laughs> I did want to make sure that um, did we address the convert the question about safe injection sites in poor neighborhoods? Well, no, no, that yeah. was that was my question because I know that you had said something earlier about the attempts to make it safer for or less transmission by oh, yeah. creating the safe injection sites. And in Philadelphia, one of the things that we've been dealing with, and um, this is just my personal view, that a lot of the locations that were proposed were um, poor neighborhoods. And the idea is that um, people were coming in from the suburbs to these poor neighborhoods to have these safe injection sites when the people in the poor neighborhoods weren't necessarily the demographic that would be using the safe injection sites. Yeah, so we're actually having similar conversations in San Francisco. We like, I think Philly and San Francisco, we're looking to one another. Um, you know, like uh, both, both. Uh, we we actually have a bill going through um, the California Assembly and Senate right now that will make safe consumption spaces legal in San Francisco, Oakland, and Los Angeles under a sort of pilot program uh, uh, to 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 see if they will work. We still have to deal with the feds, but it would remove. Um, um, state problems. Um, I, I mean, I kind of want an, ar an array of safe consumption services. And for me, the ideal way would be to integrate them into already existing services so that the people who are using, like, like I'm actually talking to you from my, my hep C syringe service program right now. I would love for my site to have a safe consumption space right here. So my folks come in for their Hep C treatment. Um, they get their, their 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 injection equipment, and they inject or smoke in a safe spot with me. And then they can hang out afterwards, um, so we can talk about whatever else they might want. So I think if we integrate them into existing services, we'll be more likely to touch the people who need them need them most. And then I think in addition to having fixed site spaces, you know. There, there are mobile syringe service um, safe consumption vans. Um, uh, Spain has quite a few. There's quite a few up in various cities up in Canada. Um, so then we can move things around so we could like hit um, um, homeless encampments and, and, and things along those lines um, and uh, provide them with the services in a really sort of like kind of easy, low threshold, low key way. And that, that ties in with the refrain about meeting people where they are, right? Like that's constantly something that we hear. 
um, meet people where they are and 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 that's how you can you know get them to use these spaces and so i think it's a great idea to incorporate it um to like if they're already seeking hep, hep treatment or, or where there are already established programs I don't, I, I can't say like where, where those are in what type of neighborhoods, but I do think that would be an easier transition. There was another question in the, um, in the chat about, uh, speaking of the feds, any federal regulations for us to keep an eye on or support? For safe consumption spaces or criminalization? Um, so I, uh, how about for yeah, both? That was from that was from me, and and so I know that we have the um, repeal act that Barbara Lee has worked on around HIV criminalization with the Attorney General's office, and I believe that specifically mentions HIV. And so I was curious if there were anything, any other federal actions that would um, really impact uh, syringe access, uh, safe consumption sites, or or Hep C in, in general? Yeah, I know there's um, efforts and movements on the syringe service side of things to at least allow for um, better access to federal dollars to fund and support syringes and all of the ancillary equipment. Uh, there really isn't anything on safe consumption spaces. Um, we'd like to see them happen, obviously. Really, what the, the big thing would be just to leave us alone. Like Philly could start one, you know, and it, it, they're, they're, the safe house is ready, right? I mean, they, they've got the people, well, they, I mean, they, they're ready to do it if they just knew that, um, that they wouldn't be allowed. And I feel like a lot of places in a lot of different cities feel the same way. Um, and uh, even if it was just uh, sort of, agreement that like in California, for example, let's say this bill passes, just let San Francisco, Oakland and LA run their pilot programs. Let's see how they work. We know they're gonna be successful because they're successful everywhere they operate. Um, and then I don't know of anything on the criminalization of Hep C side of things, but Jade is super wired into that kind of thing. So she might know more than I do. I don't know about anything that's federal that's yeah. going on. Um, yeah, I not not that I can think of. I obviously I know about the HIV with um why did I just draw a blank on her name? My congresswoman Barbara Lee. Barbara Lee. Um but I don't think there's anything that exists like that right now um for hepatitis. Are there any other questions before we wrap up? I know you guys have a, a short break before the next session. All right. If not, I just want to I want to thank everybody for joining the session, and I want to thank us, especially Andrew and Jada for an amazing presentation and giving us information that a lot of us didn't have previously. Um, and um, thank you. And also please reach out if you wanna join the um, coalition that we have that deals with hepatitis issues. I'm gonna put my email um, in the chat and I can add anybody to the listserv. Um, so pun punishment is not our Punishment is not a public health strategy and viral hepatitis criminalization. So if you wanna be a part of that group, just please reach out to me. Perfect, thank you. Oh. I threw mine in there as well. I, I was uh, My name was on the slide, but I forgot to add my email, sorry. I didn't know if you wanted me to use the Gmail and that's the only one I had, so I apologize for that. Oh no, it's totally cool, it's totally cool. All right. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your sessions.